my Govanen. Welcome to the Tolkien Lore Channel. I'm the Tolkien Geek, and I've been reading The Nature of Middle Earth, which I got later than a lot of people because it just so happens my birthday falls kind of close to where the release date was. And so I waited and got it for my birthday because my wife needs ideas. <laughs> because when all you're into is Tolkien, you run out of stuff pretty quick. At any rate, I've been reading it. And there's one particular part of this book that has been making the rounds on social media, at least Twitter especially, and it's been used by certain people to prove a certain thing about elves. And if you've been paying attention to Twitter and this particular topic, you already know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a footnote that talks about an elvish word for love, which has been interpreted by certain people to prove that there are gay elves in Tolkien's Middle-earth. Now, there is also floating around, uh, in response to a lot of these, a, um, allegedly a, I'm not sure if it's supposed to be a tweet or something else by Carl Hostetter, who is the editor of all this material in The Nature of Middle-earth, and he's saying no, this is not what this is about. And it ends on a note that makes me wonder if that's really him saying it or if it's somebody that kind of made this up and put it in his mouth, so to speak, in order to prove the point because it doesn't sound like something an academic like Hostetter would say. That said, I don't know that much about Hostetter, so I could be wrong. Maybe it really is Hostetter. But what I want to do in this video is just break down the footnote and explain why it doesn't mean what so many people are taking it to mean. Because if you actually pay attention to the language, it's pretty obvious it's not talking about gay elves. So, with that said, I'm just going to go through the footnote, and I'm going to explain the reasons why some people think it means that, or whether they honestly think that, or just using it because they want to is another question. And then I'm going to explain why it doesn't actually mean that and why that view doesn't even really make sense. So, let's get started. So the first thing to note here is there are actually two footnotes. They're basically identical, except one of them has an extra paragraph of stuff in it, and it, that's going to become really relevant because that extra paragraph of material makes it even clearer that what this footnote is talking about is not gay elves, okay? Um, so, I'm going to start with the basic footnote, and there's actually a large section of the footnote I'm not going to read because it deals with a totally different kind of thing that's not related. It deals with the root words ndil and ndur in elvish, which relate to... Uh, Tolkien basically in the footnote says it's kind of like the file or feel root that we get from Greek, which we frequently use to mean, you know, somebody who loves a particular type of area of study or type of thing. So like an Anglophile is somebody who likes the English, or a Bibliophile is somebody who likes books, or, you know, that sort of thing. So those words are totally irrelevant to what we're talking about. They're not even about people. They're not about loving another person in any sense, so it's not relevant. I'm not going to read that part. I'm just going to read the parts that are relevant to the discussion at hand, and I'm going to start with the footnote that doesn't have the extra paragraph, and I'm going to analyze it on its own terms, and then I'm going to go to the other one, which has the additional material. Now, I don't think it's clear in the book or in the notes or anything which footnote was written first, but you can tell one was clearly based off the other, so it seems kind of obvious that the longer one was probably written with the shorter one in front of Tolkien, because the wording is almost identical throughout. So let's take a look at that first footnote. All right, so the footnote begins, in the main text, it says a lot of the times elves would not marry because they hadn't found one whom they wished to marry, or as men say, fallen in love. And then there's the footnote. And then the footnote says, or as the Eldar said, met love. So fallen in love or met love. You know, that's just the Eldar way of saying the same thing. Footnote continues. In this matter, the elven tongues make distinctions. To speak of Quenya, love, which men might rather call friendship or even liking, but for the greater warmth, strength, and permanency with which it was felt by the Quindi, was represented by words derived from mel, 
ML, or melmate, a particular case, was primarily a motion or inclination of the fea, meaning the spirit, that's the Elvish word for spirit, and therefore could occur between those of the same or of different sexes. It actually says or of different sexes, but that's clearly a typo. In itself, it included no sexual or rather procreative desire, though naturally in incarnates a difference of sex altered the emotions, since sex is held by the Eldar to belong also to the Fea, spirit, and not solely to the Heroa, which is the body, the physical stuff, and is not therefore wholly included in procreation. Sexual desire for marriage and procreation was represented by the term Yerme, but since this did not occur normally without Melme on both sides, the relations of lovers before marriage, or of husbands and wives, were often described also by Melme. So, there are several things in this footnote which uh, get used. First of all is the idea that the sex of an elf is both a, an aspect of its spirit, or fea, and its body, or hroa. <clears throat> so, a lot of people have used this idea also even in, in the context of saying, well, there's trans elves. Well, no. We have enough writings from Tolkien to know that this idea is basically just a way of saying the soul is also gendered in the same way the body is. So it, it's not a way of saying those two can be different. You have a male body and a female spirit. It's a way of saying that it, your spirit, even in the absence of the body, is still masculine or feminine. And there's something there because Tolkien has to say this, rather, because Elvish spirits can exist outside their bodies. It's not the way they're supposed to be, but one of the things that we learn, and I th think this is in Morgoth's Ring, but it might be in one of the other History of Middle-Earth volumes, is that elves who die in Middle-Earth are summoned, in some sense, back to the halls of Mondos to live out whatever purgatorial period they need to be there before they are released and, and either reborn or reincarnated or whatever it is. So their spirit is, that's normally what happens to it, it goes to the halls of Mondos, but that spirit is still alert. It's a thing that has consciousness and it doesn't need its body to exist. But also, those spirits can resist the call or summons to Mondos and therefore remain in Middle-earth as essentially a ghost. And that's kind of Tolkien's mythology of where ghosts come from. Human spirits don't do this. Human spirits only ever go to the halls of Mondos, and then where, you know, whatever short period they stay there before they leave the circles of Arda, as the elves would say. So the reason Tolkien has to say this is because the spirit of an elf can exist outside of its body and therefore it has a gender. He's not saying that the gender of you know, an elf applies to both its spirit and its body because those two can be different. No, the, the, there's nothing here to imply that. So that was one aspect of it. But another, of course, is just the simple idea of, you know, men might call this friendship or liking, but for the greater warmth, strength, and permanency with which it was felt by the Quindy. So this particular kind of love is stronger than friendship or liking, as men would, would describe it. And it can occur between, you know, either two, TP, two elves of the same sex or two elves of different sexes. But he specifically distinguishes here between this particular kind of feeling and the sexual or procreative aspect of, of love. And that's important for a number of reasons. He does make the distinction between sexual and procreative because sexual in Tolkien's terms for elves can apply to just the spirit. But that's also important too because if the spirit is without its body, it has no sexual in the terms of procreative or, you know, the act of having sex, it has no sexual desires because it has no way of doing anything with it without a body. You can't do anything with that without a body. The fact that this is a emotion primarily of the spirit, or fea, in fact, tends to prove exactly the opposite of what a lot of people are taking it to mean, which is, you know, it has to do with 
elves being gay. Well, no, it doesn't, because elves being gay would precisely be, if not procreative, because homosexual sex can't result in procreation, it would still be in that direction. The, I, the, the, the desire of doing the thing that leads to procreation. Therefore, this, the fact that it's a, a emotion of the Fea rather than something more associated with the Hroa, people tend to make that think that it's like it's, that's how you get to gay, but it's really not. In fact, it's the opposite. It's just a way of saying these friendships have nothing to do with the body. They are all about, you know, finding not exactly a soulmate, but a... What, I'm not even sure what word you would use in English to describe it in the common parlance, but it's like, you know, almost like a blood brother idea. The idea that you you have such a strong connection with somebody else based on shared interests, shared values, you know, all the things that are intellectual about you, not what is physical about you. And so on its own terms, I don't think this footnote proves anything. And of course he does specifically you know, separate out the idea of the procreative and this particular kind of love represented by Mel. Now, the second version of this footnote basically covers the same ground, but goes into a lot more detail. So, I'm going to read the second footnote now, and we're going to look at that a little bit and see how this might alter what the other footnote said, or maybe it doesn't alter it. We'll see. In this matter, the elven tongues make distinctions. To speak of Quenya, love, which men might rather call friendship, but for the greater strength and warmth and permanency with which it was felt by the Quindy, was represented by Mel. This was primarily a motion or inclination of the Fea, and therefore could occur between persons of the same sex or different sexes. It included no sexual or procreative desire, though naturally in incarnates, the difference of sex altered the emotion, since sex is held by the Eldar to belong also to the Fea and not solely to the Hroa, and is therefore not wholly included in procreation. Such persons were often called Melatorni, love brothers, and Melatheldi, love sisters. Now this is really where a lot of people have done this, because they, they latch on to these terms, and this is where they really get the, the whole idea of elves being gay, love brothers and love sisters. But the footnote continues. The desire for marriage and bodily union was represented by Yer, but this never in the uncorrupted occurred without love, Mel, nor without the desire for children. This element was therefore seldom used except to describe occasions of its dominance in the process of courting and marriage. The feelings of lovers desiring marriage and of husband and wife were usually described by Mel, this love remained, of course, permanent after the satisfaction of Yer in the time of the children, but was strengthened by this satisfaction and the memory of it to a normally unbreakable bond of feeling, not here to speak of law. So there, there's a lot more to this footnote than there is in the other one. And this one is also the one that gets quoted a lot, but it's really only that first paragraph that ends with love brothers and love sisters that gets shown around on Twitter as proving that there's gay elves. Now, the interesting thing about that is the fact that it uses the term love brothers and love sisters, again, if anything, tends to prove exactly the opposite of what a lot of people are using this to prove. Why would you call two people who love each other in the way that gay people love each other brothers or sisters? That implies something more like incest, which would be... I mean, like, does anybody actually think that's what Tolkien is talking about? I doubt it. So, they're taking these terms to mean something which they would imply the exact opposite. So, I don't even see where people are getting this. I, I, I don't know if people are honestly coming to this conclusion, or if they're just being lazy, or what's going on. But if you ask me, the fact that they're looking at this footnote and coming up with this doesn't seem like a careful reading of the text, at, at a bare minimum. So, the other point to note here is, it says, the element of yer, meaning the, the procreative desire, was therefore seldom used except to describe the occasions of its dominance in the process of courting and marriage. The feeling of lovers desiring marriage and of husband and wife were usually described by Mel. 
This love remained, of course, permanent after the satisfaction of Yer. Anyway, the point being, Mel is the one that is permanent. It has nothing per se to do with the idea of sex. In fact, this second half of this paragraph almost definitively proves that the the whole idea of this male type of love has nothing to do with who you're physically attracted to. It's nothing to do with that. And in fact, another really important portion here, the desire for marriage and bodily union was represented by Yer, but this never in the uncorrupted occurred without love, Mel, nor without the desire for children. Now again, going back to my point earlier, homosexual sex can't result in children. It just can't. And we know that it can't. It takes male and female to do that. You can't do it any other way, scientifically. So the idea that the year occurs only with the desire for children actually also tends to prove that, if, if anything, it tends to prove that no elves were gay. Certainly not that there are gay elves. Now, does that definitively prove that no elves were gay? No, I mean, it can't really, but, I mean, like, to the extent that it argues one way or the other, it goes the other way, not in the direction a lot of people are taking it. And then the other fact here is the male version of love is all about a connection which does not have anything to do with procreation, bodily union, anything like that. Yer is what gets you to that. Now, once you look at all these words and put them all together and really think about it, it's like, where does the idea that this proves gay elves come from? I really, I mean, it's just not there. And I find it also especially interesting that what Tolkien says about Mel is that men would call it friendship except for the greater strength, warmth, and permanency. Why would men call it friendship if it was something besides just friendship, if it was something about, you know, a sexual desire for another person, men wouldn't call that friendship. That's exactly what they would not call it. And so, again, if you just pay careful attention to the words and take not only what they imply, but what the things not said imply, it's really hard to come to the conclusion that this proves anything about the existence of gay elves. Another noteworthy point along the same lines is that the male type of love is said to be different based on whether the person that you have this love with is of the same or a different sex. Why would that be if this is talking about something that can mean gay elves? In fact, it would mean exactly the opposite. It would be, it wouldn't make a difference what kind of sex the two people sharing it were, if they were the same or different. It shouldn't matter. And so again, just very carefully paying attention to what the words are, what they mean, what they imply, and then taking a glance at, you know, what is he not saying? He's not saying men would call this romance or love or whatever. I mean, there's just so many things in here that, on a careful analysis, give us a telltale sign that Tolkien is not talking about what the people in Twitter think he's talking about. Now, does it prove anything else outside of that? Eh. I mean, honestly, I think what Tolkien was doing here was just pointing out that elves can have very much stronger friendships with other elves than men do with other men. Men in the sense of species, not males. You know, men with other men or women, you know. And another thing about this in the broader context of the book, is one thing you learn about elves is after a certain amount of time, their spirit, or fea, becomes so dominant, they're no longer even interested in having children. They have very different concerns, very different interests. They're all about doing different things, and a lot of that has to do with the intellectual and arts type things that we associate elves with in Tolkien's stories. Tolkien's elves are very much wiser than men, very much more artistic than men. They do lots of things that are just beyond men, and part of that is because their spirits are so much more uh, 
not only powerful in a sense, but also more predominant, at least at, at later phases of their lives. And we get references to that in various parts of the nature of Middle Earth, especially where he starts talking about, you know, how elves age and what periods they're having kids in and what happens in later periods of their lives and all this other stuff. There's a lot of stuff where he goes into details about this. And so we can see he's thinking about the elves in ways of being much more spiritual than men are. And part of that is because they're extremely long lived and therefore, you know, there's only so much satisfaction of the bodily desires, whatever they are, that you can do with an immortal lifespan before it's like, okay, I need to do other things to satisfy myself. And then you move on to the intellectual, the artistic, you know, whatever it is. And even that, you know, before you get to those later stages of life, elves are still more capable and more interested in those things than men are anyway. So this idea that, you know, the, the elves have this inclination of the fea to others is totally consonant with these other ideas that get represented in this book. So it's not even, you know, I mean, just no matter what level of context you take this argument to, it never ends up meaning what the people on Twitter seem to think it means. It's like, this is just not a thing. I mean, you know, if you want to imagine that there are gay elves in Tolkien's universe, whatever, but, like, don't pretend these words mean that. The words don't mean that. The words pretty clearly don't mean that. If anything, they clearly imply the opposite. I mean, if you're going to take one approach or the other, it seems to me you have to take the opposite approach, not the one that these people want to take. And, again, to me, this just comes down to reading the words honestly and, and carefully. Whether these people are doing it dishonestly, I don't know. But they're certainly not doing it carefully. Because if you really pay attention, the arguments show that it doesn't mean that. There's just too many things in here where Tolkien gives us just, you know, the, the word choices he uses and the way that he describes it and the ways that it gets defined, it doesn't line up. So, anyway, I've just seen so many of these, and this has happened twice, by the way, when early on, before the book actually came out, there was a Google Books version that you could look at, and a lot of people found this. And then, again, more recently, a lot of people seem to have rediscovered the footnote, and everybody's like, oh, gales! No, it's not! It's really not. Like, just read it, think about what the words mean, and just, you know, go with that. You know, don't try to import ideas into it based on what you want to be there. If you want a headcanon, have your headcanon. But, like, don't try to tell me that words mean something they don't mean. That's, that's a different thing. Like, if you want a headcanon in which, you know, people are doing things outside of Tolkien's writings, whatever. But don't tell me that when Tolkien wrote X, it really means Y. X doesn't mean Y. So, anyway, it just annoyed me how many people were taking this to mean something that it just, if on careful reflection, it obviously does not mean. And so I wanted to give an explanation. Here's why it doesn't make sense. Here's, you know, the reasons why it can't really mean that and especially when you look at the broader context. So, rant over, I guess. So I hope that was an interesting and informative look at this quotation that's been thrown around a lot lately. And if you found it useful, please do give it a thumbs up, share it around. If you have thoughts about how I'm interpreting it wrong or something different, let me know in the comments. I'm totally open to having my mind changed. I just really don't see a way around it when you really look at it but you know if you think you got something better than I do put it in the comments below I'll be happy to engage because I'm always trying to learn more anyway so you know like I said like and share it around if you want to get more of my content make sure you subscribe and hit that bell icon I also of course have Odyssey Rumble and podcast versions you can also follow me on Twitter at JRRT lore for some occasional Tolkien related trivia questions and you can support me over at Patreon. Until the next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek, signing out for the Tolkien Lore Channel. Namariyeh.